Hello, and now we're moving on to the brain, right? Essentially what this entire course is about, or 95% of it, um, and not just the sciencey part, but how our brain causes all the other psychological things and behavior stuff that's going on. Um, we're actually gonna have two sets of brain notes. This one being on the more internal and older parts of the brains, and then our um, next notes being on the outer parts and newer, more evolved parts of the brain. Let me quickly just show you um, what sets of notes you should be looking at. So this is your chart where you're gonna write down the function of each of these brain structures, but then you also have these images that you need to label, and really I'd prefer that you color them because you'll be able to see right on the brain what the different parts are, so you've got those. First, we have to talk about how we study the brain, and I would just jot this down in some blank space that you have, or maybe on a loose leaf sheet of paper. Um, a brain lesion being um, one of the first ones ever done. Um, experim it experimentally destroys brain tissue to, dis to study animal behaviors after the destruction. If you're destroying a part of the brain, you can then see via their behavior what that part of the brain controls. Usually lesions are done for scientific or medicinal purposes, not just for the heck of it. Clinical observation. Um, they shed light on a number of brain disorders, alterations in brain morphology due to neurological and psychiatric diseases are now being cataloged. Electroencephalogram or EEG. This is an amplified recording of the electrical waves sweeping across the brain surface measured by electrodes placed on the scalp. So you get these electrodes placed all over you and sometimes they put like a swim cap on to keep them all on there. And then it measures and shows you what's on this very archaic computer screen, all the different kinds of waves and what that activity is. An MRI scan is gonna show you pictures like this. The magnetic resonance imaging, it uses magnetic fields and radio waves to produce computer generated images that distinguish among different types of brain tissue. Obviously it looks at soft tissue. Images on the upper right show ventric ventricular enlargement in a schizophrenic patient, which is something important for you to know in one of our last units about schizophrenia. A PET scan, positron emission tomography scan, is a visual display of brain activity that detects a radioactive form of glucose while the brain performs a given task. So they actually will inject the patient with this radioactive form of glucose and then they'll see in this big, huge machine that your brain is in um, where the activity is, and it'll show brain activity. An fMRI is a functional MRI, so when the subject is in the scanner, the researchers will be able to communicate with him, right, there's an intercom or something, but also maybe visual projection. The image of the brain depicts with colors of the rainbow, so the amount of blood flow in each part of the brain, which indicates the amount of neural activity in that brain. So functional FR fMRI is when there's like an intercom and they will say, please do the math problem 100 divided by 10. And the person will think what that is. And while they are thinking and using, functioning their brain, right, it's going to take pictures. Um, another part about the MRI and fMRI, it's going to allow um, via the computer generated image a 3D image of the brain. So it's kind of like an x-ray, but it's, it's not going to be just on a piece of paper. It's going to allow you to see like the inside essentially. So here's our first diagram and it shows you all the different parts of the brain. All of this um, guts looking stuff, that's the best way I know how to describe it, right? It looks like intestine, is the cerebral cortex. All of this stuff with the lobes and all that jazz, we don't need to know about yet. We're gonna do that in our next set of notes. Really what you need to label is the stuff that's kind of in the middle here. And this is what we call the older part of the brain because if you think about it, other species have all of this stuff. Our species is what has the more complex and more dense cerebral cortex on the top, being that we have evolved more um, and therefore is the newer part of the brain. So back to this older part of the brain, um, we can kind of work from the bottom up. This is a spinal cord that then turns into the brain stem. Right underneath this big hump here that is the pons is the medulla. 
okay, and the, its function is heartbeat, okay, it controls your heartbeat and your breathing. If your medulla is damaged, you will not survive. Your pons is that big hump on the brain stem that controls breathing, but also allows you to go into different sleep stages, okay, it kind of regulates that for you. Up the back is a finger-like item, I guess, part of your brain stem called the reticular formation. This is involved in alertness, so if someone were to say your name, you would, what, huh, yeah, you would know this. It's what allows you to wake up um, in the morning when you're waking up after a night of sleep, but also what allows you to stay awake during important things that you'd like to stay awake for, like when you're driving. Um, so then we've got <clears throat> up towards the top here, this kind of egg-shaped looking thing here in the middle of this yellow is what's called the thalamus. The thalamus is what we, it's coined the sensory switchboard. Here's what I want you to know. When your sensory organs pick up stimulus from the environment, for instance, you watching be it your eyes, this video right now, the light and those images are going through your eyes and those messages go to your thalamus and your thalamus says, ooh, this video, all these images I'm receiving, these are visual messages, so I'm going to send them to the proper location of the brain so that it can process these images. I'm going to send this to the occipital lobe. If you hear something, right, it's, the messages are going to be transmitted to your thalamus, and your thalamus will say, ooh, that's an auditory message. I'm going to send that to its correct location to be processed to the temporal lobe. Okay, so that's why it's called a sensory, hence your senses, switchboard. It tells everything where to go in the rest of the brain. Under the thalamus is the hypothalamus, hence under the thalamus. Hypothalamus controls all of our drives, all of our innate drives of hunger, of um, thirst, of sex, all of those things, it controls those drives. The pituitary gland being under the hypothalamus is this little, little dot here. We know what the pituitary gland is, right? It controls the endocrine system. Um, up on the very top here, this is kind of difficult to see um, unless it's in a 3D brain, but this is the corpus callosum, which is the fibers that connect the two sides of the brain, the two hemispheres. And we're gonna talk about what that is, or we're gonna talk more about that soon. So, and then here's just more, more in depth on the, the older brain structures like the brain stem. It's the oldest part of the brain, beginning where the spinal cord swells and enters the skull, um, responsible for automatic survival functions like with the medulla and the pons. Hence the medulla controls vital functions like heartbeat and breathing. The reticular formation being the nerve fibers up the back of the brain stem plays an important role controlling arousal involved in attention and sleep. The thalamus up at the top, again, is a sensory switchboard. So it directs messages to the sensory areas in the cortex, okay? And transmits um, replies to the cerebellum and the medulla. The pons is the bridge between the brain and spinal cord, especially dealing with motor messages, okay? But also involving with sleep and breathing. The cerebellum is um, kind of like at the base of your hairline is down here. Um, these are called the little brains. We have two of them. We have two of everything in our brain um, because it looks like a little brain. Like, look at it. It's all smushy and wrinkly, right? It kind of looks like a little brain. It's at the rear of the brain stem. It helps coordinate voluntary movements and balance. So gymnasts and athletes have really strong cerebellum. The limbic system um, it's comprised of parts, some parts that we've already talked about, including the hypothalamus and pituitary gland, but also the amygdala and hippocampus, which we have not talked about. Um, it's a donut-shaped system of neural structures at the border of the brainstem and cerebrum, um, associated with all kinds of things that each part um, is in control of. So the amygdala, their little almond-shaped neural clusters, linked to emotion of fear and anger aggression too, okay? So these are extreme emotions, not just, oh, it's a nice pretty day outside and I'm feeling lovely. No, it's extreme fear and extreme aggression. The hippocampus, there are two finger-like structures attached to the amygdala and these are involved in processing new memories. So anything new is processed through your hippocampus. 
Hypothalamus, under the thalamus, directs several maintenance activities, eating, drinking, body temperature, and sex. It helps govern the endocrine system. There are two parts, and yes, it's very important for you to know the difference. The ventromedial, so a way to help you understand or remember this is vomit. You're not going to write that in an FRQ, but your ventromedial will say, hey, I'm going to make you puke if you don't stop eating. So it tells you when to stop eating. Your lateral hypothalamus says, let's eat. Again, you're not going to write that in an FRQ. It's just helping you to remember the function. And it tells you when you are hungry, when to start eating. And then we have up at the top, the cerebral cortex, intricate fabric of interconnected neural cells that covers the cerebral hemispheres. And we're going to talk about that more in our next set. But this is where all higher order thinking is controlled. The corpus callosum <clears throat> being the band of nerves that connect the two cortical hemispheres and carries messages between them. We technically have two brains in our skull. Two brains completely separate from each other. The only way that they communicate to one another is that corpus callosum in between joining them and allowing them to communicate. 